Eugene Q. I don't know if you've ever seen the building. The building's quite large. He's actually on site at Livermore, but if you were in the building, you're, it's about four tenths of a mile from one end of the building to the other. And I live at one end, and um, we've taken over the blue jean space, and this is the act, one of the actual cryostats that we have in place. So I'm going to walk through today and tell you a little bit about quantum computing. Now, I viewed myself somewhat as the entertainment because I don't look at that you're going to learn a lot from this exercise, maybe the exercise afterwards. Hopefully, you guys got an email and you can sign in and maybe get an account on the quantum experience run on the real quantum computer that we have there. Um, there's a lot of things I sat in on the sessions this morning and listened, and I've learned a lot that I guess I, I knew some of it, but it's kind of nice to know that you're going to have the exact same problems on a quantum computer. In fact, it's a lot worse. So if you look at kind of the early slide that Pete showed where you saw a woman there and she's flipping in the, uh, the program through the switch registers, that's kind of where we're at today with quantum computing. So in a way, I'm going to try and co-opt you into um, helping us to actually get engaged and figure out how do you program this thing? Because the paradigm is vastly different than anything that we currently know about standard computers. Um, it is quantum, so it's, it's kind of unnatural. And right now, largely physicists and some trained mathematicians in quantum information end up thinking about this very hard, and they do a lot of the, 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 um, the programming for this. So I'm going to give you a high lower overview in what I'm calling the quantum computing promise, and you'll obviously you know, I, I wouldn't say you should listen to IBM Pablum by itself. You should go out and make your own decisions. You need to look at D-Wave. You need to look at what's happening at Google, at Rigetti Computing, and all of the other various startups that are happening. And Pete's right that the number of startups have been exploding in this field. I mean, um, in the beginning of the year, uh, IBM, uh, no, sorry, uh, MIT Tech Review said, this is the year of quantum computing, and this is kind of make it or break it. Now, you know, you read that and you go, ha, eh, what the heck? But you know, I'll tell you from somebody who's sitting in the pits, the senior management's going, ooh, you're going to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of pressure. Talk a little bit about popular modalities, and what do I mean by that? Um, how many people are physicists in the room or have a physics back? Oh, great, perfect. So you all understand sort of a basic thing about quantum mechanics. So the, the, and I will talk about it in a little more detail, but the idea is you can encode information on any type of quanta. And there are many people who have done this in many different modalities. Uh, at IBM, we have chosen superconducting qubits, and I'll talk about those in a lot more detail than I will about the others. I'll introduce them, but only in a very cursory sense. And I'll show you how we actually encode the information and then compute with it. Um, and then I will talk briefly about applications, and I'll talk about what we call the IBM quantum experience, which I'm all encouraging you to get accounts on, where you have a 5 and 16-bit uh, qubit quantum computer available for you to um, use on the cloud. So moving right along. So that you're, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this stuff, that there's a, a huge promise that if I think about and I like to think about way back when, you know, Babbage and then electromechanical tabulation. And things from this point forward about the vacuum tube and the transistor and integrated circuits, I really view as enablers to conventional digital quantum or di digital computing. And the types of things that you think about and the types of problems that you solve today on conventional computers have a specific mindset. And, you know, we see this big X here with an arrow going up to quantum computing. I'm hoping by the time you get done here, you'll actually realize you can't say, well, how many flops does it have? Or how much will it compute? I don't know that we fully understand the amount of power that we're going to unleash. Um, how many people have kind of looked at the history of quantum computing? This exploded when Peter Shore, anybody? Who, Peter Shore was a physicist at uh, Bell Labs, and he wrote a paper in, um, I believe it was 1995. It showed an algorithm that said, if you had a quantum computer, you could factor prime numbers in uh, polynomial time rather than exponential time. And of course, funding went through the roof after that. <laughs> so of course, I'm a physicist, and many of you are as well, so we can't have, have to have some sort of homage to Dirac and Feynman. And Feynman, in many ways, really kicked this off. He had a, a paper back in 1982, I believe, and he was talking, and he, eventually he was talking about using path integrals for doing computation, but he was saying that really what I want to do is I want to compute quantum mechanics. And, that, and all of you 
many of you have seen physics. And you know, you hear this thing, Hilbert space is a big space. Now, what is Hilbert space? It's a nice way of saying a, a big um, Cartesian space. Um, and if you think about the number of levels in an atom, you kind of explode two to the n, and so very quickly, you can't simulate this. So I think in Feynman's mind, what he wanted was a quantum computer to actually be able to compute quantum mechanics. And for those of people that came out of the high energy physics and like quantum chromodynamics, well then you hope that you'd be able to compute that as well. So what is the difference? I mean, there's kind of easy and polynomial problems and that there are another set of problems that are hard and probably never be solved. And the quantum, we're hoping that the quantum computer are, lives over in this realm of where we're going to solve problems that today are highly intractable. Now I'm here to say, also say, remind you, as I said at the beginning of this, we're not there yet. In fact, if you go on and you start playing with our systems, you're gonna say, ooh, you can't do too much with this. Yeah, that's true, but we have to learn, we have to build the infrastructure in order to make this a reality. Um, so there is no such thing, real thing as a compiler. You'll hear some of my colleagues say there is a compiler, but that's what takes some sort of conventional language and turns it into the uh, pulses that actually do the, the work. Why compu quantum computing? So um, I do work in the IBM Watson Research Center, and IBM has made a, a killing on doing silicon for a long time, and I don't know if you all know, most of you probably do, that IBM sold off its fab about two years ago. They used to have two large fabrication facilities, one in Burlington, Vermont, and one in Fishkill, and they, they still have some, but those were the, kind of the major ones. And I think the last node that they first pushed out was uh, 14 nanometer. And now they're, they're within the research center, they're pushing down to seven nanometer. But if you kind of look at it, we're kind of at the end of that curve I showed in the beginning of you're actually gonna to start to see very bad quantum mechanical effects. And lithography devices for getting down to seven nanometers, I think they're up to, I don't know, 20, $30 million just for the lith lith lithography device. And these aren't like the standard lithography that they've done in the past where you can just change out the masks. These things are set, you buy this tool and it will do this one node and that's it. And then you'll have to buy another one. So this is not really what I'd call a good scale for the future. So I've looked at some of the things that have been presented this morning, and I think you've got 10 or more years out of pulling out a whole bunch of really neat tricks out of the bag in architectures and the way you're going to incorporate GPUs and ASICs and other kinds of things in a heterogeneous fashion to improve computing for the next 10 years or maybe even longer than that, because it's sure gonna take us a while to get with a quantum computer to the level of we can, where we can do things like you're doing today. Um, and again, I am relying on all of you to pull some of these tricks out for the quantum computing as well. Um, just in terms of terms, there's this thing called uh, quantum information science. I assume all of you are familiar with Claude Shannon and uh, kind of his, his theories about what was a bit and that sort of thing. But the way we kind of have grown up and thought about that um, a bit is a very classical sense. And so with a quantum computer, we actually have to introduce new concepts of quantum information. And so you've, you've all heard of the uncertainty principle from Heisenberg, and we actually take advantage of this. So this is kind of, I call it, um, when I was still in physics, I used to say, geez, you know, there must be a lot of stuff that we can exploit from physics and turn into something commercial. And here is the case. Um, the other thing that we'll, I will walk you through is we're gonna talk about entanglement and superposition. And all of these things combined together enable you to have a different computational paradigm. But we'll get to the point where I, where I sit under, make you understand why it's different. So here's the first part, classical bit. You know it's a zero or you know it's a one. And the quantum information, you can actually have a superposition. One of the things I like to do when I'm talking to people in a crowd, and uh, you know, this is like, oh, it's after lunch. You guys are all ready to fall asleep, right? <laughs> Too much lunch. Um, I don't remember in, in the slide deck, I had introduced the concept of what's called the block sphere, but it's a nice way to represent this superposition. And for those people that aren't physicists, if you haven't seen this notation before, 
the way you have to think about this is it, it's just standard linear algebra and physicists love to do things that, uh, to redo mathematics because they like different notations. But you're saying that I've got a certain, and this is a complex number amount of zero and another complex number amount of one. And the way you can represent that on a sphere, and if you guys, and, you know, when video was here and they were talking about their GPUs, I know them from graphics processors. If you've ever done any graphics processing, everything we do to manipulate that state is exactly the same you would do in graphics processing. It's this SU2 system, simply unitary two. So there's these two level systems. And you know, and if I think about what's on the block sphere, I have a zero at the top, a one down at the bottom, but I can occupy any space on that sphere for representing my number systems. And that's part of the power because I can get, if I get a huge number of bits and I allow them all to interact with each other in this way, that's part of the, the um, computational power we get. You guys should interrupt at any time if I'm going too fast, too slow, anything like that, your questions. So um, I've already kind of covered this where you've got an n-bit system, but here you can have what are called, these are superposition uh, states, but also they're entangled. So I, I can't, these are unseparable states. And so I can represent what a, a large number space with a few number of qubits. Now one of the things I want to point out, and you guys are, have, are running into this when, they, I, when I was in this morning talking about topologies uh, from networks. Right now, to the best of our knowledge, and I'm not saying this is forever, but it's true today, these are good problems. If you can find a problem where it's very hard, or what you would call CPU bound, and I can load it into the computer, I can then use this kind of representation, and I can explode the problem, and actually explore all parts of that space simultaneously. That's a really good problem for a quantum computer. But if somebody comes up to you and they say, you know, I've got this voluminous amount of data, or you know, you've got this thing called the quantum Fourier transform, and I've got a huge volume of data, and I can do a Fourier transform on this huge volume of data, I'm gonna um, speed things up. They're lying to you. Because today, we don't know how to move that data in and out of the machine very fast. It's very, very slow to move it in and out of the machine. So even if we had a very, very large quantum processor, the best problems are the CPU bound problems. So there's another thing, and I, I brought this up kind of superficially, and I said the coefficients in front of these vectors that we've got of bits are complex. And so inside a quantum computer, the phase is, in, is important. So when I did this, this exercise where I say this is a zero and this is a one and we can occupy any space on between, that phase information is actually part of the angle on that sphere for a bit of representation. And so when you actually do the computation, that phase can interfere with itself, and it's the, sometimes it's the interference patterns themselves that are actually the computational part of this. Am I losing anyone? All good? <laughs> so here's some problems that we're kind of thinking about. Um, if you want to get more into this, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm going to uh, in, ask you to go look at the um, complexity theory. How many people know about complexity theory? Okay. So if you go and you look at complexity theory, you know about NP-hard problems and all of the various pieces. I'm really a hardware guy, so um, you know, you're going to get a very hardware-centric view of the world from me. I'm kind of weak in those areas. But the types of problems are, you know, like the traveling salesman is one, or when we've got problems where, these are simplified, obviously. I've got a warehouse and I want to figure out somebody places an order and what's the most efficient way to get that order placed. Like in the case up behind me about cutting lumber, what's the best way to, to line this problem up? That's a good example of what I say as a CPU bound problem. And the other one that we're, we're particularly interested in is um, molecular and chemical dynamics. And I'll show you one slide on that coming up in a moment. Um, to date, one of the, on the Google machine, the first thing they did was helium hydride, which I don't even know if you can make that for real. And we've done lithium hydride on ours. And the number of orbitals and the number of states that you actually get involved in there is already becoming complex for a conventional computer. It's kind of long. 
the one thing I will point out also is that for the simulations that we do, we do exactly as, as you were talking about these heterogeneous systems where you have the quantum computer as a coprocessor and a very, very large machine next to it. Um, you know, being IBM centric, I'll say someday it'll probably be a P and then the P system will interact with the quantum computer and they will bounce back and forth and then I hope, although it sounds like I'm being discouraged today to think this way, that the um, operating system will actually think about what problems it should throw out to the quantum computer. I guess what I've heard today is you should always know your architecture well and, and be willing to exploit it wherever possible to figure out when you're doing your coding, how do you do that most efficiently. Um, very brief slide. When I was in school um, many years ago, you know, I learned the stuff over here on the right about logic gates, and I was told, oh, if you had a NAND gate, you can build an entire computer. So I'm telling you, well, eh, we don't have NAND gates, and I've told you that you have this, what I'm calling an SU2 system. So there's my block sphere up there. Since it's a two-state system, you, then, you can't represent it as single numbers. So now, instead of single numbers, I actually have matrices that tell me how do I get from one state to another. So those are the rotations that I've talked about. For those people who have taken physics, those are just the Pauli spin matrices. Over here, I've kind of expanded these, and these are the kind of the other operations, and these are some of the, what I'd say are the schematics of what you would do when you write down a circuit to say how is it gonna propagate. And when I show you that next, um, what you will see is that you have kind of qubits, and then they propagate in time through various parts of the circuit. And these are kind of, um, one is the top is the single qubit operation, but these are kind of multi-qubit operations. And with this entire basis, this mathematical basis that I've assembled, but think of this as kind of down at the conventional gate level, is how we're going to be doing our computations. So when we do these interesting problems, and unfortunately, most of us at um, Watson Research, when we say this, we start saying, well, you've got to figure out a way. You describe your system using a Hamiltonian, and then you have to figure out how do you take this Hamiltonian and convert it into a Hamiltonian that's similar to the quantum computer. Useless for you guys. <laughs> so we have to figure out a way to take the conventional problems and trans just be lost in that translation. And, and I'm sure that when you go back to the, the days um, when pre-compilers, when people have to do plug boards and things like that, they actually had to think that hard. Uh, now I'm going to get into a little bit of detail. So there are these things, and again, I'm going to refer to the physicists. They can draw upon their knowledge. Um, this is the, all of the terminology that we use in quantum computing comes from nuclear magnetic resonance or MRI machines. And so they've defined these uh, parameters, which are called T1 times, T2 times, and T phi. The T1 time, it's, it's so when people talk to you and you've read newspaper articles, one of the things that'll come up, maybe Scientific American, is this concept of coherence. What is the coherence time? It's the lifetime. How long can I store information on that bit? But it's, it's, you can't just give one number. The T1 time is if I'm in the one state and I'm in a pure one state, how long will it take just to drop to the zero state? And I'm going to tell you right now, it's about 100 microseconds for what we do. That's not a lot of time. One of the important things, I don't think I put it in the slide deck, but I'm going to tell you right now, when somebody tells you their coherence time and they say, oh, it's very long, well, you should immediately follow with, how long is your operation? So that in order for us to perform what is called a single qubit gate operation, us, it's about 20 nanoseconds. So the important figure is how many operations can I perform before you lose the coherency of the system? And it's the ratio of the coherence time to the gate time. Now, unfortunately, the downside of this is when we go to two qubit gates, they're up around 100 uh, um, nanoseconds right now. That's a little bit long. So then T2 is a concept of, so I've come down to the equator. I'm um, in a superposition state. And sometimes what happens is the qubits will actually start to freely rotate around that. 
So it's called the dephasing. But many times in the popular articles, they'll actually leave that out. And T phi is actually equates all of them together. So here are some problems that are on the docket for us to be working on as physicists and engineers are how do we overcome some of the, the errors. Now, I haven't talked about the control pulses on these. I've sort of magically said I can get them into these states. I'm sure in your undergraduate laboratories when you took these courses, you did things where you excited systems. Maybe you looked at um, fluorescence or anything like that. Well, you did some of what we're doing here. Um, in our systems, we use microwave pulses. In trapped ion systems, they use lasers. Anything that you're used, you just look for what is the energy separation in the quantum system, and then you excite it with that amount of energy, and you change from one quantum to the next. The other thing that I love to tell people and pick on the other people that have done CMOS all of their lives, they come in and they say, oh, you're doing it all wrong. We're going to come in. We're going to tell you how you do this better, how you're going to scale up to millions of, of qubits overnight. I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you have to forget everything you learned. Why? Well, you're dealing with Avogadro's number of electrons. I'm dealing with like one or two photons. And that's it. And it, unfortunately, in our systems, it turns out we actually talk about noise in fractions of a photon. So when this very complex system happens in any one of these kind of green or, or red, blue types of things that are happening up on the screen, Though you can get noise coming in from any case, and it will interrupt that system and cause some level of decoherence. So also the other thing to remember is decoherence comes from the qubit interacting with the environment. So the other things that will happen when we, do, we have imperfect control pulses because, well, it's very difficult to do quantum mechanics. Um, You've got qubit to qubit couplings. You know, instead of just coupling with the environment, if I do an operation on one qubit, sometimes it affects the other qubit. You've got to fix this. So I like to think of it as the early days of DRAM, where you had to have refresh. So we've got that sort of problem, but in spades. Um, and then actually the measurements. So measurements are kind of very difficult for us. And when we talk about all of these things, we don't talk about it. Like you, you pretty much say, if I do an AND gate, I do a NAND gate, I do any one of these gates, it's going to happen. The level of success on that is pretty high. We talk about the fidelity of the gates. And we say, just like you talk about the fidelity of yield in, in a um, place where you're doing fabrication. Right now, our single qubit gates are about 99.9% .9 accurate. That's not too bad. We'd like to get that up to four or five nines before we say we're really going well. Our two qubit gate operations are about 99.5. We would like to be those at four nines. And our readout fidelity is about 95%, and we would like that to be very high. Why am I saying all those things? Because what you're going to do is if you were evaluating various quantum systems, you have to think about these gate operations, and you have to do multiple gate operations. So you think about this as a probability of success or a probability of failure. After 10 gate operations, if I'm at 90% or anywhere below one, life starts to get bad very fast. So in addition to asking the question of what's your gate time and how many operations can you do in your coherence time, you have to ask the fidelity. So you know, when people say this system's better than this system, you should, there's a lot of questions that should be answered. It's not a cut and dry type of problem. So let's talk a little bit about implementation. Um, there's ions and neutral atoms. So the ion cases are really cool. They've actually gone very, very large in the number of qubits they've done. So what you'll do is you'll select some um, angular momentum state inside the, the atom. You will ionize it, typically. And the, what you're seeing in the picture here is for um, actual ions. Neutral atoms are difficult to hold in place. But when you ionize something, you can put it in a homogeneous magnetic field and very carefully separate all the atoms. Um, so that, that's handy. Now, they are very good because they're very loosely coupled with the environment, but that means they're very difficult to talk to. Um, and I'm really going slow here, so I'm going to have to speed up. We've got semiconductor spins 
in quantum dots. So that's actually where they take it, the spin of what's ever in the, the medium, or um, they use an electron and look at the spin. And in our case, on this, the far right here, is we use superconducting circuits. So what I've done here is, uh, for those people who are familiar with, say, the LHC, they use niobium titanium wire and the LHC for the magnets. We use niobium and we actually played it on silicon. So we're taking advantage of all of the history of IBM. And this is true of many other places that are, um, like Google, that are doing superconducting modalities to make um, essentially standard ICs into superconducting circuits. Other, these are some other cases of uh, simple ion traps. Cases of quantum dots. I'm sorry I'm speeding through these, but I realize I'm looking at the time up here and I realize I'm going way too slow. <laughs> so let me focus on what we do. For those people who have had an electrical engineering background, I'm sure you've all had one in the past. One of my view viewpoints on life is all of life can be simulated by a simple harmonic oscillator, and that's what we've done. This large diagram up here, you have a capacitor and a inductor. Now, if you just take an art, a, a capacitor and inductor, you all know that makes a resonant circuit. If I make that superconducting, I cool it down below its critical temperature, it then quantizes. The problem is that all the energy levels are exactly the same, and so when I go to hit one energy level, I may just walk up that ladder. So we want to introduce what's called anharmonicity, and we do that by introducing this thing called a Josephson junction. And that's what it looks like in a uh, micrograph. And it behaves like um, it's a, a tunneling circuit, and it behaves like an inductor mathematically. So it introduces this anharmonicity that allows me to uniquely address the, the, the individual qubits. And so that's what you're seeing here is that I now have zero, one, and two states, and the energy levels between them are not the same. So what does it look like in real life? This is the inside of a dilution refrigerator. So I'm gonna give you a rule of thumb. Um, for our systems, we cool these down to 15 millikelvin. That's pretty darn cold, if you guys had figured that out. And uh, I was just mentioning a moment ago, the efficiency to get to this temperature is pretty horrendous. We don't use liquid, we use cl cold, closed cycle systems. And you pull about 10 kilowatts of wall power. And for that, you get about 20 or 30 microwatts of cooling power at the bottom stage uh, down here where the qubits actually sit. And you say, well, why do you do that? So the, the, on the previous diagram here, that 0, 1 transition is about 5 gigahertz. It's a standard microwave signal. There's a, one photon there. And I'm going to tell you something. 1 degree Kelvin is roughly speaking 10 gigahertz of radiation. So the white noise in the system swamps out your actual operation. So we cool it down to make sure that the probability of spontaneous switching just due to thermal noise within the cryostat won't swamp out the calculation. Oops, going backwards. Um, I've talked to you about T1 and T2, and so you can see that we've kind of had a, a steady increase over the years. This is in terms of microseconds. Um, and so this gives us promise. One of the things that I'm, I'm also I'm doing some blatant advertising here is that on average we are continuously increasing and that is the important thing to do. So you will see people that will quote, um, well I got this great T1 or T2 time and usually what they're quoting is their best. At IBM, you know, this is a traditional thing uh, we say we want to do this and we want to make a machine out of it like we've done with, say, Blue Gene or some of these others. So we have to make sure that this is highly repeatable. The controls, looks pretty messy right here. These are actual readouts of a, a system. Uh, right now, in this particular picture in the upper right, you're seeing um, just ordinary waveform generators that we buy off the shelf. In the engineering group, what we're trying to do is take that that's about when that picture was taken, it was about $250,000 per qubit to do an excitation, and we're trying to beat that price down to about $10,000 or less. And that's to get substantially down to make this highly viable. Um, but there's a lot of operations going on here, and this talks about what's called the cross resonance gate, and it's how do you produce this particular operation. So I'm gonna skip this one. I already talked about this a little bit. Let's talk about applications. So, any questions here? Everybody good? Um, you, 
you probably already noticed that I'm referring to this and making sure you are dreadfully aware that this still is in a highly primitive state. So I, I did this a while ago trying to figure out, could I relate this to some sort of history timeline? And so, you know, there's a, a little bit of quantum mechanics put in there along with um, computers. And I really believe we're kind of at the point inside this blue box where there's still a lot of theory that needs to be done to, to actually get quantum information vetted more fully to get it so that it's not just you know, highly trained physicists and mathematicians that understand that, that we get the computer scientists in, involved with this, that there's actually a two-way flow of information that we, we both learn each other's language, that we can communicate effectively so we can make kind of larger and larger systems. And although I presented you with a particular modality of a qubit, I don't believe that that is going to be the be-all and end-all. I think it's really like the germanium transistor. And if you've ever read this book, uh, I think it's called Crystal Fire, something like that. And it talks about the early days in Bell Labs when they made the first germanium af just after they did the point contact transistor. And oh my god, those things had a failure rate that was just astronomical. So we, we're still learning how you actually fab these things. Because what happens, you fab these things. And I just told you previously that I'm dealing with one or two photons. Any schmutz on the surface, anything you leave over from cleaning the surface, has other what we call two-level systems that are nearby in frequency to the qubit frequency. So I suck energy out of it. So the cleanliness and how we do the fabrication is really critical. And we're, we're still kind of learning that. I talked about Chor's algorithm. Um, this is a high degree of motivation. You know, let me dwell on this just for a moment because I think that it, what, this gets a lot of hype and press. And so everybody's worried about, well, you know, you'll, you'll do this, you'll make a quantum computer, and suddenly, all of my RSA codes won't work, or you know, my codes on my web browser won't, will be cracked and that sort of thing. I'm here to tell you what I have not talked about in this is that I've talked about gate operations. Um, in order for me to implement Schwarz algorithm, I have to make what's called a logical qubit. Because the, the amount of time, people have done the calculation, the amount of time necessary to do, say, a 1024-bit uh, factoring on a quantum computer, as we imagine it today, is about a day. And I've also told you that our coherence time is about a mic 100 microseconds. So wait a minute, that's just not going to work. So that the, the theorists have come up with this concept of what's called a logical qubit. It's a way of, of putting, so you guys have seen all sorts of error correction codes in your past. Hopefully I haven't seen them because you're above that. But they do live in a lot of computers, and in the early computers, they were actually fairly prone to either radioactivity um, in uh, C3 type things, or even in cosmic rays. And I think the rad hard stuff, they're still very prone to that once you put things in space. So you have these various error correction, and there's like CRCs and all the various redundancies. What happens here is because of the types of errors that we have, we're not just correcting for it's a zero or a one, but we also have to detect the error of has it rotated around and how do I fix that? It's about 100 to 1 expansion. So if I want to encode one bit of information and I want to protect it in a way that's long enough to do, say, Shor's algorithm, I've got an explosion of about 100 to 1. So now I'm up in sort of hundreds of millions of physical qubits in order to do calculations of size. So that's not really tenable today. So I'm going to talk about what's in the blue box here, and this is something we're focusing on very heavily at IBM, because you say, well, we're not going to get there very soon. What can we do? And we're going to say approximate. How many people have actually seen, I think somebody earlier talked about this, I think maybe you did, where you talked about in order to sometimes save on energy in a computation, they'll either dial back the power. I think you talked about dialing back the power, but sometimes they'll actually change the clock speed or the depth of the register as the computation proceeds. And these are all energy saving techniques um, so that you can get larger and larger systems. But it's, it's what's called approximate computing. And so we're trying to do the same thing of saying, OK, we know we have these large errors. What do we do in the presence of these large errors? And how do we cast our problem in order to get that to keep going? 
So we're trying to produce various things that do that. And so these are the types of problems that we're working with. And as I said before, you know, I've brought up all these terms. They're kind of confusing. You've got a Hamiltonian. These are the types of uh, SU2 groups. You, you know, you can get into this. Here's my power system. My power system creates these various um, unitary operators and operates on the quantum computer. And it comes out and tells P, well, what kind of result did I get? And repeat, rinse, et cetera, until you get the right answer. Here is one of the cases where we've done that on a, a small number of systems. And um, forget that it looks like it's a, a simulation of hydrogen. And you can see on here the quantum computer trying to do the simulation, a classical computer, and the theory. So we're doing simple toy problems because that's what you do. First you do simple toy problems and make sure you can, you, you're able to actually replicate them. And then we've been trying more and more complex systems. Um, here's something we don't quite understand, what's going on here. But that's fun. I mean, again, uh, for those of you who uh, actually got into this field because you want to say, I want to know what happens when things don't go well. You know, when things go well, it's kind of boring. I mean, I'm sure that when you're doing real problems at work, you say, I wish that didn't happen. But the real fun is when stuff like that happens. Um, you know, certainly, even though I'm not heavily engaged in high energy physics anymore, I'm always very excited when somebody says they're going to violate the standard model. <laughs> One of the things I want to also bring up is, so I'm not really heavily understanding um, sort of the field of, of computing, but you guys have metrics. And I think it's kind of like running um, BLAST or LINPACK, those sorts of things. And I always say to people, you know, I don't really care what your metrics are. The most important metric of all is if I go to a client, it's how well does your problem run on my computer? And if it runs better on my computer and it costs you less, that's a win. We're introducing this thing, and you know, these, this is really interesting because when I was watching today, I see all of these pieces come in, and we're, we're talking about this thing about quantum volume. And then it goes, the number of qubits, more is better, but that's not the big thing. Connectivity, you guys are all intimately familiar with connectivity and parallel computing. More is better for you guys. If you could get all to all for free, that'd be great. The gate set, if your gates span a larger space, you know, this is risk versus sysk kind of thing, that would be better. And errors, less is better. So here's a, uh, something done for our communications department. And what we're trying to do, this is our estimate of quantum volume. And I've been talking to you about this gear gear rate along here, number of qubits. And you know, ideally, what we'd like to do, or what I tell my management is, I want to march up this diagonal over the next 10 years and try to get up into that upper right-hand corner. So that's my mission for the remain until I retire, which hopefully happens soon. Um, and I think I'm pretty close on time. I was going to switch into, I was going to hopefully go over this a little more. Um, but you know, it's kind of the next part of the session is we've got this thing called the IBM Quantum Experience. So last year, last May, I think it was May the 4th, 2016, for those uh, ultra nerds, you know, that's a very important date. <laughs> um, we brought it online. I'm not sure that any of us, we just thought, gee, it would be really nice to get this out in the open. I don't think any of us anticipated how successful it would be. It's been gargantuanly successful, so much so that we almost can't keep up with it. Um, I'm going to have you guys log into it if you haven't already, but there, it, there's been 15 papers submitted into various referee journals, running it on this, and one of the things, I'm going to do a very shameless plug now, as I have been kind of consistently, that I really believe is important is this is a brand new field. In silicon, in conventional computer science, you have a long, rich history that you're drawing upon and you're continuing to try and push that forward, as you should be. We're at the beginning of this field. And so the most important thing that we can do as a company is provide the resources necessary to get people engaged to actually build this infrastructure so that we have the right people coming out that can do the next generation hardware, software, everything. 
because what we think today is not what's going to be reality tomorrow. And I think I'll stop there for a moment, and then we'll get into the, the actual uh, demonstration. Or questions, whatever you guys want to do. So. So I'm going to say this about that. <laughs> and uh, first of all, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to tell you a personal opinion. I don't represent the IBM Corporation for this particular opinion. Um, the D-Wave system, to me, is quantum mechanical in the exact same way that a transistor is quantum mechanical in any of your standard devices. They're exploiting a certain level of quantum mechanics. But it, it, how many people are familiar with the downhill simplex algorithm? Okay, so it's, it's an optimization algorithm. And that's what they do. They actually set their, what they're calling their qubit system and its superconducting devices. And they set it up and they allow it to evolve to the ground state. And they try to do that very quickly and they do it iteratively. So far, what we have seen that every problem that they have done has been able to then solve by a standard optimizer on a classical machine. And usually, at least at the times when they pissed off the math department at IBM um, about a year ago. That was a really stupid idea. And um, they showed that you could actually run the simulation that they were running on their um, D-Wave machine on the laptop. <laughs> so if I'm, they're highly dubious of their claims. That does not mean you shouldn't buy one and evaluate it. <laughs> yes? Um, what are the prospects for improving the rate at which you can set the state? You said at the start that it's very difficult to prepare the state for uh, calculations. You have to do a lot of operations on that to make it worthwhile. But uh, are there any, is there any progress in setting the state faster? You mean state preparation? Yes. State, uh, so what I said is, I, um, so if you'll excuse me, I'll wax poetic for a moment. There's a wonderful thing that uh, when we, I talked, walk you through kind of the intermediate pieces of the various fidelities, um, we call them spam state preparation and measurement errors. <laughs> but you're talking about the state preparation in particular, and we're at, um, for state preparation, I said we're around 99.9. .9. Yes, there are ways of improving this. And it has to do with understanding exactly the models which we believe we understand about the qubits. I think that what happens, is, this is still what I would say an experimental field. You make some assumptions. You, there's a lot of assumptions that are made into this, first of which is going to a two-level system. And then you send in your microwave signal. One of the things that I think that you guys should do, could do in collaboration with us is try an optimization for optimizing pulse shapes. I suspect you'll be able to improve that just without even understanding exactly why. You mentioned that it has to be cool to you know very low temperatures, milli kelvins, and so essentially, is there any prospect for miniaturizing it, or does it have to be? Well, up to it's fairly really? small. Um, the actual 16 qubit machine is about the size of my fingernail. That's it. It's not that large. The, I guess, from the machine as a whole system, I think the answer is yes. But I think what's going to happen is that the type of modality will have to change. You're going to have to get what are into some sort of self-protected states. So if you look at um, Microsoft is doing what I'd say a very long bet. They're working with uh, uh, the University of Delft and they're doing what's called uh, topologically protected states. So in topologically protected states, they're relying on a particular system that where we're trying to artificially encode it in an, um, in an error correction they're trying to find physical devices that actually have those states and can be operated at room temperature. That will be a big win if that ever comes up. But it, I heard someone recently say, there are horses, ponies, and unicorns, and the Microsoft venture is a unicorn. <laughs> yes? So I'm curious about, uh, so when we have an uh, NQBIS, and then after the, when they go, uh, go through the 
some gas operation or planetary transformation. So we have uh, several uh, super, uh, superposition states. And uh, I'm curious about how, what is the result we want to get from the superposition states. So really good question, and I'm sorry I didn't really bring that up. What you actually have to do is collapse the wave functions. You have to perform a measurement on it. And so you, what you're getting out is fundamentally an amplitude measurement. Um, and it's a probability distribution, and you have to collapse it to its final probability state. So you will get out one singular answer in the end. It will be a multi-answer state until you do the measurement. Does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, sure, go ahead. So, uh, so in IBM system, do you use, uh, is the, the QB is a solid state QB, or is a is it, it, It's solid state in that, Fundamentally, what we're using are superconducting metals to make the, uh, the yes. So right now you don't consider like my Majorana? No. So, I mean, that falls in the state of, if you had a Majorana fermion, that would be another unicorn. <laughs> that would be great to find one of those. I mean, you know, first of all, great physics find. Yes. You mentioned before that the, the traveling assessment was a very good problem for the quantum computer. can make it uh, an algorithm which would be very efficient for a quantum computer for this kind of problem. Now, is there a theoretical research for other problems that we don't know yet, but maybe the quantum computer totalizes your algorithm would be much faster? Even very classical problem like matrix inversion. Yes, so there's a great website that's maintained by um, NIST, if you're familiar with them. Uh, it's called the Quantum Zoo. And I would implore you to go look at quantumzoo.gov. And on that, you will find all of the algorithms that people have thought to, of to try to date and their potential for quantum speed up. So there are um, simultaneous equation solving. There's a, whole plethora of them, but the, I will caution you that what they've done done is in a highly theoretical state without taking into account the entire system. So it would fall, in some cases it falls in the category of what I was talking about earlier uh, in the hour of how do I get the information in and out of the computer? Like Grover's search algorithm, great algorithm, but we're never going to be searching databases, at least probably not in my work lifetime are we going to search databases. <laughs> 